All right, so this is 11 honors, and I'm going to, uh, I don't know what can be seen right now, but um, that's a picture. The reason I'm showing this for you, to you is because Emily, Emmeline, Dick, Emmeline Grangerford um, was a poet, a bad poet, but she was a poet, and she was also a artist. And do you remember anything about her artwork? She drew pictures of um, young girls, just like herself, and she died young, but young girls who were in some state of emotional distress. Um, like in, in one picture, she, the girl is holding, she's at a, a tombstone, and she's holding, she's collapsed, you know, on it or in front of it, and she holds, she's got a letter in her hand. Or it's always something, some, um, something symbolic she's holding, and she's, she's very sad. There's one where she's, um, she's looking up at the moon, and, and again, has something in her hand that might tell a story. And then there's the funny one. Those are kind of, they're not meant to be. Emmeline's obsession with death is what, she's making fun of people who are obsessed with death. Um, you know, who think about it, she writes about it, she draws about it, she thinks about it. That's not normal. It's not healthy. Uh, as, as you read the book, Huck Finn has the perfect balance there. When Buck died, he shed a tear and then moved on. When he made a decision that ultimately caused the death of the men on board the steamboat, he said, you know, I didn't, I didn't worry about it too much. It was either them or us. I mean, it, it sounds hard-hearted, but um, he actually tries to save them later. But Huck Finn's an example of somebody who's not sentimental. Emmeline Dickinson is somebody who is sentimental. And of course, she even dies early. Uh, it's just not normal to be obsessed with, okay. The artwork, when I would read in, in, um, in that section, I'd always say, I've seen that before. Those pictures I just described, I've seen them before. And I figured out where I'd seen them was in literature textbooks, which we don't use. But they would have artwork, famous artwork in it. So somehow I was able to uh, pursue the artwork. And I came up with, if you take the, the words off, I came up with a name, Augustus Egg. He was a Victorian period. That's really what period we're in in America with Huck Finn. Uh, it's called a Victorian era in England. And there was a poet, I mean, a, an artist called Vic Augustus Egg, pretty, pretty memorable name. And he drew a series of pictures. I've only really looked at these three. I'm gonna show you three pictures that I am sure Mark Twain was familiar with because it, you'll see at least one or maybe two of the pictures, they seem to be exactly what uh, Emmeline Grangerford was, was painting. But they tell a story. This is called Past and Present. This is actually the best picture of it I could find because it's clear. Past and Present, number one. There are three, so it's a triptych. A triptych or three pictures that, that work as one. They kind of go together maybe to tell a story. And these three pictures tell a story. And um, it's actually a story that the author is trying to correct something in Victorian society, and that is the way women were treated. Okay, well, here's the story. And it, the, the details in the picture tell a story. So you have, well, what do you see? You tell me, what do you see? Besides the letter A plastered all over. What do you notice? What do you notice here? Aurora, sorry. A lady laying on the ground. Yes, that's kind of odd in this setting. What else do you notice? Delaney, what do you notice? There's like two girls, like, Yeah, one of them is looking at the woman and, and one is not. And what do you see? What do you notice? I don't know if it's like, like an apple or something. Or yes. Very good. Half of it's there and half of it's there. Of course, the man, he's got something in his hand. I can't see it. Um, I've looked at other versions of this. He's got his foot on something over here. Um, some other detail, you see a house of, uh, uh, putting cards up together, a house of cards. Um, you see a big uh, 
mirror that reflects the open front door. And this is actually a picture, you'd never notice from this, but it's the ex expulsion of Adam and Eve from um, uh, paradise, from the garden. This is a picture of some storm. Um, those are the basic ones that I can remember. This tells a story, and the story is this. That's a husband and a wife and, a ch and the children, so it's a family. The husband has just uncovered an envelope, which he, I think he's holding the envelope in his hand, and it's either a note, but there's definitely a photograph that he's got his foot on of his wife's lover. So he's just discovered that his wife was committing adultery. Um, she's on the floor, and some details that, that you may not have noticed, she's got um, these are bracelets, but you know what they kind of look like? What do they look like? Kind of. Because their hands are together and she's got these, but they look like handcuffs. Um, and so what, what the author in this triptych is trying to do is point out that he's not celebrating her adultery. Like, that's an okay thing to do. But in the Victorian period, the husband was allowed to kick at, at this moment, kick the wife out of the home, which is represented by the open door in the, in the mirror, and take her children away from, their children away from her, uh, kick her out of the house. And she's a woman in the Victorian period. She has no other means to, to provide for herself. So basically, because of her adultery, the law allowed the husband to throw her out on the street with no means, visible means of support. Um, the apple might make you think of what in this context? Poison. Yes, or what else? Yes, and of course we know that the Bible never says it's an apple, but most people call it that. What would the house of cards perhaps represent? Well, that, that's an expression. It, it made a TV series about it. What does the House of Cards usually suggest? Yes, yeah, fragile. Any minute he, it could collapse. Of course, the expulsion of Adam and Eve uh, from the garden and the storm over here. Um, the little girl, it, they actually know who the little girl was modeled after. I, I mean, somebody we wouldn't know, but it was somebody living at the time that the artist modeled the, the, um, the, the girl guy. And so this is the first part. This would be the center picture. And on both sides, you have, you have um, past and present. Well, this is the past. On both sides, you have the present. And it's two scenes, which I'll show you. So this picture is five years later, and the one that I'm going to show you after this takes place at the exact same moment. So uh, past and present, or present, number two and number three, um, were, were at the identical moment in time, five years after the woman was kicked out of her house. The first picture is of the one of the children that you saw in the other picture. You notice she seems to be a little bigger than either one of the children in the first. Um, the, the story is that the husband died, but because she's still an adulteress, she, she cannot raise her own children. So the woman in black is some guardian who's now taking care of one of the little girls. Um, Who's, you can see her face is in her hands, and it's a very destruct. This was one of the pictures that reminds me of, of Emmeline Grangerford's uh, pictures, because there's a moon and there's a cloud, 
the very next picture is supposed to represent the exact same moment as this picture in another place because you'll see the moon looks exactly the same and the cloud looks exactly the same. And again, notice her looking at the moon. What does that pose suggest to you? Like if you saw it in a picture or if you saw it in a movie or something, someone's looking up at the moon. What is that? What emotions or what, what, what does that suggest? Do you, you have any idea what? Yeah, it's a it's the contemplation. It's, it's and it's sad. You wouldn't sit and you look at the moon. I don't know. It seems like to me that that image is is a sad image. They're contemplating. They're looking at the moon. And let me show you the other picture. The last one. Yeah, that's the these. Maybe we'll be able to see it. I, I don't know. It looks pretty dark to me. Well, it doesn't give me that option. But you'll have to do it. This is the exact same moment that the other picture takes place. And I'm sorry, you can't see her, but that's the mother. Look where she is. She's, oh, this is the Thames River in London. She's, um, I mean, looks like she's homeless. It's at night. She should be in a bed with her family in a house, but she's in this place because she's homeless. You see the same moon and the same cloud that you saw in the other one. Um, and if we could see it, which we can't, um, you see on the walls uh, uh, handbills for plays that are being performed in London and one this one right here is a play called Victims which should make you think of the woman um, the other one is um, I can't remember what the other one is um, but again she is looking at the moon like the woman in the other picture is. now the point of the pictures was to show that the men of the Victorian period had absolute right to uh, throw the woman out of the house, take away all her means of support, make her homeless, and there was nothing. The laws protected that. So he's actually, he's actually painting these pictures to to garner support for changing those laws and having people have more sympathy for women. Um, and I just thought this is the kind of thing for different purposes that Emmeline Granger that that kind of very romantic, very sensational. That's a sensational story. The, the, the adultery, the homelessness, death. I mean, it's got all those things that would normally make a very tragic s story. And um, so that's, that's what, those are the kind of things that Emmeline Granger was, Grangerford was interested in. It's not healthy, and Huck has a much healthier idea of, um, of life and death than Emmeline Grangerford, because Huck is realistic. And that's something I want you to know for the test. So I'm going to turn this around and ask you to get out the, um, the practice or review sheet and let's just look a minute at, at the poems by Emily Dickinson um, before we just put this away. Um, so hopefully you have that with you. We did the uh, we did the uh, Walt Whitman So the poems that we are, you need to know for Dickinson are The Frigate, Stop, Stop or Death, Fly Buzz. We're not doing the middle one if you were coming in the fall. We will do Lap the Miles and Narrow Fellow. 
Uh, so if you have the poems, uh, that might be helpful. So starting with There's No Frigate, you remember the main idea of the poem? There's no frigate like a book to take us lands away. more than help you learn what it would tell me you're, you're on like, the right track like for sure books can also be like entertaining or like i guess they can feel more important if it's something that like you have to to be able to learn okay. okay remember he uses three images um he uses the frigate the courser and the chariot and what, what, those are the three images. What do those three images have in common? Frigate, courser, which is a war or horse, and a, a chariot. What do they have in common, Delaney? Think, think about it. A frigate's a boat. A horse is a horse. And transportation. So what does transportation have to do with books? It's all on the lines you were saying, but what does transportation have to do with reading, Isabella? It can be like transport you. How? That's right, exactly right. But what do you mean transport you? Like you can use your imagination. Say that again. You can use your imagination. Right. Um, so it can, you can travel by book. How is books better than horses, frigate, and chariot? What can books do that those three means of transportation cannot do? Um, that's that's absolutely true. And, and what what does that also suggest that you could do in a book that you can't do with a uh, a normal means of transportation? Yes. Um, why do you think it's important that she uses the word chariot? Um, courser sounds like a medieval word. Frigate. We still have frigates in the navy, so I don't know. I don't know what that sounds like. But remember, we said that um, books can can go back in time. You, you can't travel. You can get on a horse and go back in time. But books allow you to go back in time. What else is superior about the book to this? It says, this traverse may the poorest take without oppressive toll. How frugal is the chariot that bears a human soul. So what, what else can a book do, or what advantage does a book have to chariot riding? And, and by the way, that's what makes us think about the past, which there were no chariots in New England in the 1800s. So that's a, re that's a reference to ancient history. But what else can books do better than the, this other travel? He says, the poorest may take it without having to pay the toll. So Isabella, what, what can books, what advantage do books have? So you can be poor and travel through books may not be able to travel literally on any other form of transportation. So it's superior in that way. And finally, what does it mean how frugal, which refers to its inexpensiveness, how frugal is the chariot that bears the human soul? What else can books do that normal travel cannot do? What? What kind of things? It mentions the human soul. What can a book do that you cannot find by just getting on a horse or a train or anything else and just traveling across the country or across the ocean? What can a book do? The human soul, what does that suggest? Well, 
is your soul going to be affected by traveling on a boat across the ocean? Not necessarily. Just traveling. There has to be other factors involved. Um, how can a book affect the human soul? You know any book that could do that? The Bible could do that. And maybe there are other books that speak to something deep inside it. So you see, you see the advantage that she's the comparison she's making between forms of travel and books, which you don't necessarily you don't always think of as travel. Uh, that that's a lot more than I probably, but it, that is the poem, and that so if you understood the poem like that, then whatever I ask you, you should be able to answer. Um, what about I could not stop for death? It's the next poem if you if you're looking at it. I don't want to have to reread it. What is what is that poem about? And usually we're talking about the speaker being hurt. But how do we know that the speaker is not her, or at least not her in the present, in this poem? <clears throat> it, the poem says, because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. So how do we know that's not real? That's not possible for the real Emily Dickinson to have been dead because she's very much alive when she writes it. That's just, so when we say the poet is the speaker, it still is the speaker, but it's not speaking about an actual event. What does this poem tell us about death? Because that's the answer that I want you to come to. Do you remember? Do you remember, Diane? <clears throat> Do you remember? I, know, I guess it's been a long time. Isabella, you remember anything? It. It's kind of in the, let me look, look at the last uh, stanza. They pause before her gravestone, her burial spot. And she said, since then, the day that she died, um, tis centuries and yet feel shorter than the day I first surmised the horse's heads were toward eternity. So what is she, what comment about death is she making? What is she saying about eternity? Right. But the, she said the day, the first day she died, and she has consciousness of it, seemed longer than all the years in eternity that she has spent. How is that possible? says, since then, tis centuries, and yet feel shorter than the day I first surmised the horse's heads were toward eternity. So what was the, the worst part of dying for her? It wasn't the pain. It wasn't even the length of time. What is it? And it just says it right there. Isabel, why don't you read it, that last paragraph. What was the worst part of dying for her? It was Yeah, how can centuries feel shorter than one day? That's what she says. What? What's making her suffer? Yeah, say it again. Yeah. It's not the fact that she's been dead centuries, but when she realized she was going to die, and the part about death that she scares her is it's really, really, really long. And we didn't mention this, but what does she never mention in this poem about death? Yeah, I mean, it's the first thing I think of, and she didn't mention it. 
All right? That would be the second thing I might think of. What would be the first thing I'm thinking of? Or you might think of about death. When you think about death, what? I hope. I know what I'm thinking of. What? Yeah. There's no mention of heaven whatsoever. That may tell us something about Emily Dickinson, or it may not, but uh, this poem is not about like a spiritual experience or anything. It's just the, it's about the thing itself. Uh, turn the page. There are just three more. Uh, I hope the last two will be easier than that. Remember the fly buzz poem? Uh, I heard a fly buzz when I died. So, again, it could not be her telling about a real experience. Um, but you remember the last thing she sees before she dies is a fly? What, you remember what the poem is getting at? I heard a fly buzz when I died. The stillness in the room was like the stillness in the air between the heaves of storm. The eyes around had wrung them dry, so there are people in the room. Uh, and breaths were gathered firm for that last onset with the king to be witnessed in the room. I willed my keepsake, signed away. She's, she's talking about the things, the last thing she did before she closed her eyes in death. Um, she, she noticed how still the room, she heard people crying. She signed away her will or whatever. But then a fly buzz, a fly interposes itself between the light and me, and then the windows failed, and then I could not see to see. So what is she saying about the last thing, Delaney, that she saw before she died? You know, we are having a test on this. That's why we're doing it. I'd rather not give you the answer since you ought to know the answer. I said, what does this poem say about death? The fact that the last thing she sees before she dies is a fly. It's all in the poem. It's not, you know, it's not really interpretation. One more time. Right. Um, and, and that's particularly what she said in the other poem, but here, she also said she was waiting to see the king. Who's the king? But instead, she sees a fly. What do you think she's trying to say? About her faith. Uh, yeah. That, that's right. That's, that's right. That she's the the real Emily Dickinson is wondering if all this is true about it because she could imagine getting to that point and being betrayed by God. It's not going to happen, but that's what she's worried about. Do you get that? Uh, the last two poems are easier. They're not. There's not much to interpret about them. Um, do you remember what I like to see it lap the mob? Do you remember what that was about? It was more, it was more like just a riddle than anything else. Do you remember what she was talking about? I mean, a train. a train, right. And she gave all these examples of it. It's just, we didn't go do a lot with this, but there's a lot of different, like if you were gonna write about a train, what device, what, what sense would you probably stress? Like the five senses, sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch. Which of those five, and it, it, it could be different for different people, but which would be a logical one to focus on? A train. Like, what's the sense? Do you, what? That's possible. I mean, it's really not a wrong answer. I would say hearing, the reason I say that, because that's what she seems to be emphasizing here, because she uses all these different devices consonants and assonance and alliteration and rhyme. She's using all these to, those are sound devices. So she's trying to get you to hear the train. And then finally, the narrow fellow in the grass. Do you remember who he was? 
Again, it's kind of a riddle. A snake. Um, well, we could we could leave it at that, but I think because of the way she ends, how does she feel about snakes? The way I probably feel, maybe you do. She doesn't like them. Um, because what happens when she's around them? How does she react to them? Remember it says, without a tighter breathing and zero at the bone, she gets nervous and she starts breathing. It affects, you know, affects her physically. And any time you see a snake in a poem or a literature, what should at least you consider it might refer to? Snakes. Satan. Satan, the serpent in the garden. It may not have anything to do with it, but you have to at least consider, okay, is this, and what does the snake in the garden and real snakes have in common? That would make that a logical connection. But a real snake, if you saw one right now and you saw Satan, what reaction would be maybe similar? Afraid. Yeah, I mean, he was a serpent, and so you think intellectually, okay, that could be it, but we would react the same to both. Do you know anybody who likes snakes? I guess there are people that do. Do you like snakes? I do not like snakes. My brother has a snake. Has a what? Really? Yeah, it's crazy. How big is it? One. They're like me. All of them are me. It's not like me. It's all of them. In your house? Yeah. Do you live in the house? In his room. So are you near his room? I'm like right next to his room. Is that, is that, is that freak you out? Yeah. I'm where, where, where did he keep it? Here. He keeps it on the Like aquarium type thing? Yeah. They were in there? Yeah. Have they ever gotten out? Mm -hmm. Really? I could imagine somebody making a mistake and leaving it open. Well, I'm glad I asked that question because I have a, we used to have a boa constrictor at Page High School and he got, he got away. He was in the science lab. And I mean, he was gone for months and they found him and they can get places. And I mean, he's huge. You know, it'd be hard for him to hide, but he did for months. And I think that's the creepiest thing about it, where they hide, you know, where they could show up, you know, because they're so sneaky and slithery. Um, anyway, do you ever have to take care of them? Like feed it, what do you do, feed it? Or somebody has to feed them? Oh, to feed them. Yeah, what do they eat? They usually dig for them on crickets. And what? Okay, living reacted that way too but I'm washing my hands of it and so tomorrow make sure you study the um, the other part too let me just check time-wise what we're doing I can't keep it up, keep up with it. Uh, we got 105 so we got a few minutes you can't get in your next class anyway so Sarah this was for you